let's say a prayer. Father, thanks so much for this night and for letting us gather uh, as Christian writers and help us to get our messages out whatever way we can to as many people as we can so that people can keep putting their faith in Christ stay faithful to the end. In Jesus' name, amen. Tonight we are talking about beyond self-publishing. We spent a lot of meetings talking about different ways of publishing yourself and creating your cover and your interior and doing all the heavy lifting yourself, uh, not only writing the book and editing the book, but then being your own publisher and marketer and distributor. But there are other ways to get your message out, and uh, I would love to let you hear about some of those. So we're going to talk about uh, traditional publishing and hybrid publishing and some newer ways to reach people like a YouTube channel. And there's all kinds of ways. If you're a wordsmith and love words and want to give it a message out with your words, you aren't limited to uh, just one way. You can do different ways. And I want to read a verse or two that sets the stage for this as well as just this whole online Christian writers group. Why do I care so much about helping Christian writers get their message out? In John chapter 20, verse 30, uh, it says, Jesus did many other miraculous signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. And I just think Jesus is working and he's been working for 2,000 years since then. And uh, I've written 30 books myself. And you know, that's just my little snippet of what I've written about how Jesus has worked in my life. And I know Jesus has worked in each of your lives in so many ways. And so whether you're writing fiction or nonfiction or poetry or prose or children's books or adult books or uh, whatever you might be into, I think just having a Christian worldview does volume. So it doesn't have to be a Bible verse. It doesn't have to be, quote, scripture. It doesn't have to uh, uh, be a Christian book per se. But I think just flooding the marketplace with people who have the Christian worldview will be super helpful uh, because the whole world uh, needs to hear a Christian message. And so I'm just glad that you're uh, wanting to jump in and do that. And then the same on the other end, not just the writing of it, but how do we get it out? What are those channels that we use to reach people? And how do you reach people with your message? So tonight we have Mary Felkins, American Wave, and she's going to share with us first about her first book that she published with a traditional publisher called Call to Love, and just how she shopped around and researched and found a traditional publisher, and they did a lot of the heavy lifting on the back end. Mm -hmm. uh, so behind the scenes uh, so that she could focus just on writing. And then she uh, launched it and did the marketing afterwards, but she uh, really uh, let them do a lot of the layout and design and uh, editing and things like that. And so we'll hear about her experience and how she went about doing that. Because not everyone is interested in self-publishing like I am. I love doing all of it. I love the control. I love diving into all the details, but uh, there's there are advantages of traditional publishing. She's also got some a new project, she might be self-publishing. So she'll be in our hybrid publishing category, but she's got knowledge with several things. Second, we're going to have Richard Knox join us uh, in a little bit, and he is the director of sales for Moody Publishing in Chicago. So he's responsible for getting books into Costco and Walmart and getting uh, Moody's books out uh, to the masses. And uh, I asked if he might share a little bit what his perspective is for any of us, recommendations for us as we prepare uh, what can we best do to prepare ourselves as authors and uh, prepare our books uh, and our pitch to publishers so that we can be considered uh, by a, a big traditional publishing house. And then joining us in the second hour is Murphy Napier, and she's going to talk about her YouTube channel, which uh, she has just passed 200,000 subscribers. And amazing. She's a 20-something friend of my kids. And uh, I, I just love her. She's great, uh, vivacious, strong personality, and she loves to write, and she loves, loves, loves books. So reading books, writing books, uh, sharing books with others. And her YouTube channel is a book review channel. So she reads books and talks about them, and uh, lots of people follow her. And so I think you'll be interested to hear, because you're not limited. I mean, I've, I've done a, a email list for years, and this last week I have I have gained over 25 years. I've gone up and down, but I'm at about 22,000 subscribers on my email list for 25 years. And Murphy has been doing this a few years, and she's passed 200,000, so 10 times what I do uh, on her YouTube channel and reaching people all the time. So 
I think there's great ways to reach people and you're not limited to uh, whatever your preconceived notion might be about how to get your message out. There's all kinds of ways. So with that, Mary Falcons, you want to jump in and share a little bit or a lot or whatever is on your heart uh, about, yeah. about uh, maybe your traditional publishing route and how you jumped into that, uh, you know, why you chose that, and just sort of you know, how, you, how you went about that process because people would love to learn how to do that. Okay, yeah. And I actually moved from my cozy spot on the sofa to sit back at my desk. Uh, it felt like I was in a dungeon. And then my dog just walked in. So I kind of feel like I have to babysit a geriatric dog. But but I really, when I started, I've, I've said, shared this before, but in 2012, when God called me to write, I wasn't thinking, I wasn't looking at the options of traditional versus indie publishing. I didn't know any other way, which I think that was probably wise of God just to have me enter into the whole publishing world as this is the way, this is the way you do it. So I went to my first conference because somebody recommended this conference and said, this is where you'll meet all the industry, industry professionals. This is where you'll will connect with different writers. And so I really just had a very narrow way of looking at it. And I don't regret that at all. Just kind of looking back, I, I didn't have a checklist of different options. So I went to the conference and met with different individuals, you know, those 15 minute appointments and had my story and just and hoped that they would invite me to send something. And then I had to learn what that something was. For some, it was a full proposal. And for some, it was just a handful of chapters, just dependent on the size of the of the publishing house. And then was then I went back again in 2015 and got the contract in the October of that same year later. So again, that was also at a conference that you yes, got that contract. Conference. So okay. yeah, and, and again, I I don't know that there were other ways that I was aware of to make that connection. So in the whole process of that, though, you have this network of other authors that are doing things. and But that's where I learned there's a whole other world out there of other methods. But that was what I felt more comfortable with. I liked the idea of being a part of an organization, a little bit like a family where you have, they share the load, where you, you do the work of the writing, and then they have people edit, editing. And so for me, that, that, that appealed to me. And in addition to the conference and the, the learning, the whole process of learning how to craft um, a novel, which was something I had to learn and continue to learn. And if I can ask, I assume that you pay for this conference, and is it a conference you'd recommend still? I mean, is it something that you, you'd say people go, you should go do this kind of thing? Or Yes, this one is the Blue Ridge Mountains Christian Writers Conference, and it was one of the one of the bigger ones. And again, this was recommended, and because it was – and near Asheville, not far, that was the big appeal. Right now, for the first, usually they meet every May. Or for, since the beginning, it's always been in May. But because of the virus, first of all, they didn't know that they would be able to have it at all. But they are having it in November. And they're doing two options. The same with a lot of different organizations. There's the online version, like a virtual conference. And that's a little bit less. I think it's two hundred dollars or two fifty maybe, and then three fifty if you want to attend the conference in person. But then that requires masks, and that kind of gets off the subject. But that's where both both of those options allow you to listen to different speakers, and also allows you to have appointments depending on you know again if you're looking at traditional, you want you want to look at editors that are associated with publishing houses. Um, or agents just kind of depends on what you're interested in. Uh, so, so that's one that I, I like that it does cover all kinds of writing. It's not just fiction. So typically the question among other people that you sit around the table with is what do you write? So it's either magazine or it's devotion, or it's poetry, it's fiction. So it's kind of nice that you're among people that are writing and they feel called to write. And they're all there to learn and have varying, I guess, degrees of success and where they are in the journey. So you have a lot to offer and you have a lot to learn. And that's a good thing to keep in mind, just that whole perspective anywhere. So. And then when you went back and you 
met with a you probably met with a few publishing houses or something and what did they ask for you at that time did they ask for a few chapters or did they ask for what did you have to bring with you how how much writing did you are and and if you don't mind sharing just sort of what the contracts meant i mean did they pay you do you pay them do they share the low just and what the royalty i you know it, whatever you feel is appropriate to share but i think it's helpful for people to know you know or what what kind of thing they might get into well, what they ask for, the first thing you do, of course, is pitch, and you, you need to be very brief. And if you've said something that captures their attention, then they will say, hmm, tell me more, and then you can elaborate a little bit more. And so so that's usually how that works. And this can also happen. One of the beauties of Blue Ridge, let me just sidetrack with that, is that if you do not get a, an appointment because it's their schedule is full, which is very common, that you don't have a sign-up slot. They have the opportunity over a meal time, over lunch and dinner also, where you can sit at their table. So each table has a table tent with Sally Sue agent, Sally Sue author, um, you know, publishing house or editor. And so you can sit and they're supposed to encourage everybody at the table to, to treat that like a 15 minute appointment. So what they would ask for might be a full proposal and if it's with that publishing house, you need to go online and make sure you're really, really aware of their guidelines. And I read this a lot in writers' blogs where they'll say, you would not believe what we get from people where they don't spell our name right or they send a proposal in that's kind of their own design, their own format. So they'll have specific guidelines for what they want. And it's very common. You have the, the, the intro letter. You have your bio, biographic information, what you've published, if anything, at that point, you have the marketing, and then you have your sample chapters, usually no more than three, or they might say no more than so many pages, and the synopsis. So those are the big parts of it. There's also comparables where you have to show other books that are similar to yours, how yours is similar or how it's different. And you don't want to be afraid to say it's similar to maybe Harry Potter or uh, say Beth Moore Bible study. I mean, you, you try to find your place in the market is what they're looking for. They want to know where it's going to sit on the bookshelf at the bookstore. They, and so they right. just, so you have to find maybe four or five or six examples of my mm -hmm. book is similar to this and this and this. Yes. And, and yeah. nobody likes writing a proposal. It's, it's, it's awful. I've done two in my lifetime and I, I hope to not ever have to, to do another one, but I did one that I finished in May and I'm still waiting. I'm in the queue and this is to, 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 um, to an agent. So that's another story. But so, so if they say, sure, send me something, you need to know what that is. And then, and again, even within, like if you go online say to Steve Lobby Agency, they'll have their guidelines for what the proposal is for that, say that agent or that, um, or if it's a publishing house. And even within the agency, there might be different um, guidelines or formats that they want. So just do your homework with that. A lot, some of the smaller publishing houses, you don't need to have any agent representation. You go online and you look at their sample and you pretty much copy it as much as you can, putting your own information in there. Um, and so for this contract that I received in October after a May conference of 2015, I believe I only sent five chapters, which is a little unusual. Typically three is plenty, but this particular editor with this publishing house, Pelican, only asked for five chapters. And that was enough for her to say, I'm thrilled to offer you the contract. Okay. Mm -hmm. And you said, yay. Yes. Well, the other thing, too, that I've learned, if you go to a conference and you meet with whoever you meet with, make sure that you email them right after you get back and, and you're doing name dropping. They've seen a thousand people. Their brain is dead and they won't remember if you, a couple months later, send them something. So it's, I always would go back and say, thank you so much for the privilege of meeting with you at Blue Ridge Mountain Conference so they can remember. Um, thank you for requesting 
a proposal or whatever it was they requested and then you say when you think you can get it to them and be very quick to do that. So there have been opportunities that I know other authors have lost because the invitation gets um, kind of fades away. So time is real important. So you really commit to, if you have that invitation, it might be a big flat no, but make sure you send something. And they talk about that at conferences that not a very large percentage of authors that get an invitation to send something to a publishing house will actually follow through. And, and it's true that sometimes they, they will just be accommodating and say, yes, I'd like to see your work. And they may not really have an interest in it. You can't, that's not for you to, to decide. I would, I would milk that for all it's worth. You've paid money to be there. And I really do squeeze water out of rocks. <laughs> So I really have done a lot of that. And if it's no, 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 then at least I've, I've done what they've asked. And sent. You, you really work this system really well, Mary. I'm really proud of you for you. You're, you're, you're committed and dedicated about the contract itself. Do you pay them? Do they pay you? How does all that work? With this, they, there's no cost to me for any of the editing. So that's invaluable. There's no cost for the, cover design so they do because they do all the formatting and they do have the connection with the online retailers they do take a royalty so i believe i'll get 40 percent say of a kindle download um, i get a huge discount if i order the hardback or the, the actual paperback from them i don't have a paperback this this one is hardback but i do get a pretty big discount for that and you know i, I guess it's pretty standard industry um, were you required to buy any number of copies or no commitment on your part? You no, didn't. no, they, they, this particular publishing house offers you 10 PDFs, which really you get, you get the protected PDF. You don't want to give any copy, say an advanced reader copy uh, to reviewers. You don't want to give anything that's not protected, but they, they, if you have a street team, like we talked about before, 30, 40, 50 people, for them to say you can't really give it out more than 10 times this when I questioned that they said that it really doesn't matter you can you can give it out as often as you need to you just have to be really careful that you don't ever give anything that's not watermarked or protected okay so but I like that that you didn't have to pay anything I and mean, some publishers they'll charge you five thousand dollars or ten thousand dollars to do that they'll say oh we, you've been selected we want to we want yeah. you to do we want to do your book just pay us $10,000 and we'll do everything. So you're really just hiring them. You're not, mm -hmm. and some people are selective, but, and then there's other publishers that, and I'm not saying this is bad. This is just the way it is. And I want people to know uh, that'll say, we'll do all of this for you. You're just required to buy 2,500 copies. Yeah. So at your book, at the, your author rate. And so all of a sudden you're still paying a big amount of money, but uh, it depends on what they're doing for you. So I just want to make sure yeah. people know, when you go to a publisher and they say, oh, we've selected you, make sure you know what you're required. And then there, are, on the other end, there's publishers that will pay you in advance. They'll give you, you yes. know, a few thousand dollars or uh, we had uh, uh, someone that published with Zondervan on last month and he uh -huh. said, yeah, they paid in advance to the three of them that wrote it and they split the advance between them and then they take that out of royalties until it's paid back and then they start getting royalties and stuff. So and then, yeah. And you hope that you put your book performs well enough to get that back that they, you know, they're taking a risk when they do that. And if not, then that you may not get another contract. You know, that's the thing I'm, so I'm with a publishing house. There's no guarantee that anything I submit, I could submit a manuscript every day and for different reasons, they may reject it. So there's, there's not a guarantee with that. You, you have the opportunity. I mean, you're, you're in the system, so to speak, as opposed to having to start all over again. But that's something to consider. And now you're shopping your new book. Have you found a publisher? You're looking or, well, I know you're also self-publishing a devotional, but you've, you've got a yeah. new one and you're pitching. And where are you in that process? Can well, I? Yeah. So, so what I did is I wrote, because the, the book Call to Love was with this publishing house, I did write a Christmas novella in two weeks, which I don't recommend. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I did submitted it later, and the they you know gave me permission to submit it in July. 
and usually the deadline is April, but they said for, for some of the authors, they, they would allow it to, to, to be later. But because it was not solid, they didn't really feel like they had time. It wasn't ready for this year. So, and the Lord said, are you not doing a devotion? Do you really need to take on a fellow on top of that? So my point is I, I wanted to submit it with Pelican because I already had a relationship with that editor and she already knew the characters in the first book. And this is the story of the younger brother of the heroine whose story pretty, pretty surprised me. So I, she said, please submit it again next year. And, and she gave some free feedback enough for me to think, okay, I've got some work to do on it. So that was, that was mm. helpful. And I may do that or I, I may self publish it, but so I, that, okay. that makes me sing. But okay. I have a, the three part series is what the proposal was that I submitted to an agent. And oh. then I'm just waiting. That's, that's a whole nother series. So I'm working on the third of the three part series. So now you're trying to pitch it to an agent and the agent would then pitch it to publishers and deal with all that. But yeah. you can get the agent to, to buy into the three part series or the three book series. Yeah. Well, uh, here's the thing too, that I didn't realize about agents that maybe everybody and their dog knows, but I thought that, and I had an agent for two years as well. So 2017 to 2019. Okay. Um, I'm not presently agented. So we broke up, but Okay. When I had an agent, I was under the assumption that everything I wrote had to go through him. Mm. And then I realized, no, that's not true. And that they actually encourage you to, to write some things on your own is so long as you do it well, like Eric Elder style quality, professional, great cover. You <sighs> tread lightly. The words were tread lightly. So, okay. so you're free to do that. But if, but if I wanted to get into a bigger house, it had to go through him. Mm, interesting. So you could mm -hmm. self-publish or you could do a small house maybe, but if it's a bigger house, he wants yeah. the business. So, so that makes you a hybrid author, which is technically what I'm looking to be once I actually have this devotion done. But So, um, so it really depends on the type of book and what you want to, who you want to pitch it to. Yeah. And yes. I know for me, I, I've pitched some books to some companies and agents and some I've said, I don't think they'll be right. interested in this. So I'll, I'll send exactly. it across. But I didn't know if I needed to be locked into one organization mm -hmm. who believed in every project that I do, but I don't know if that's such a thing exists. So. <laughs> mm -hmm. some, some authors have just, they started with ABC publishing house and they've just done really well. And they've been, I guess, treated well and it's just, it's taken off. And so if it's not broken, why fix it? But they also are publishing on their own because you are at the mercy of the publishing timeline when they say, I think I got my cover. I was trying to remember, I want to say it was January of 2018. And then another email later after we went back and forth about the cover was the announcement that it would release in November of 2019. And I remember looking at the email to make sure that that wasn't a typo. <laughs> I thought it's like having the frosting and the cake is not ready to come out of the oven. Wow. So you have the cover to promote and to, to be kind of a teaser and yada, yada. But mm -hmm. that time, if I were doing it on my own, no way, no way, <laughs> you know, would have those together. Yeah. You've got the book written, you got a cover and publish it. Yeah. Okay. Upload it to Amazon and two days later it's available to the world. But mm -hmm. of course there are books out there that look like they were made in three months and, or written in two weeks, a Christmas okay. novella. <laughs> Maybe a little feedback would be helpful. But yeah, maybe you're touching on it now, but you know, pros and cons, I guess, of pu traditional publisher or having a publisher and self-publishing. What would you say would be some of your your strongest things that you liked about having a someone else publish it and maybe some of the strengths of self-publishing? What, what would be those? Uh, I think, well, one of the things are, I heard... Um, Kent Sanders talked about this, the idea of intellectual property. You know, they they... When you're with a publisher, they do own those things and they have the right to your work, I believe, up to, for seven years before you can kind of reclaim it and decide you want to, you've learned some things in seven years, you want to revamp it and so forth. So it helps me to have a team of people to work with who are in that industry, but you do have to give over control. And I may have shared this before, 
you know, I was really pleased with the editing process. I struggled with the, the cover process. There wasn't a separate graphic designer in this particular publishing house. And that's one thing that you do want to investigate. Is there somebody that really knows this that does that? Is there somebody that knows this well that does that? All the different pieces to it. But I had input, lots of input about what I wanted and didn't want and shared photos of what I liked and didn't like. And, but there wasn't what I would consider collaboration. And that's real important to me in a publishing house or in, in any, whether if I did it on my own, I would of course collaborate with somebody I'm paying to do editing or cover design, but it was, here's your cover. And that was, unless there was a gross error, like a misspelling of my name or the title, that was it. You got so, a one one shot. That's your cover, and there's no other choice. Yeah, and it had a tagline on it that was not mine, and it, I didn't feel like it represented the book really well. So we went back and forth, but but there because it's a it was a smaller house, it was a little bit like uh, a mom with a lot of kids, and I was one of them, and we were just supposed to sit in the corner and be quiet, and that's against my nature. <laughs> In some um, situations. So I did, I thought I could say, oh, okay, this is wonderful. Let's just change this, this, this. And it was like, no, that's your cover. So it would be like, men, bear with me. But if you had a, a dream wedding gown in mind and you hired a wedding dress designer and you and you showed all the things you liked and all the things you didn't like, and they took all those, all your input and the pictures and then and then said, okay, here's your dress. And you, and you look at it and it's wonderful. Let's say it's like ivory <laughs> color and taffeta. And you really wanted white with, you know, like a satin fabric. Well, yeah. they say, sorry, this is your dress. And yeah. you're going to walk in, in front of 500 people in this dress. So that's a little bit how it felt. But yeah. again, it was my first experience too. So yeah. I was learning. Yeah, and I think each publisher is different, and so you just want to check out those details. Like Mary said, you know, who do they have that's helping design? Who do they have that's helping layout? And what is your input? There are other publishers like Morgan James. I've just been looking at them, and mm -hmm. uh, they, you know, they do a, a real collaborative process where okay. you work on the cover together, you work on the layout, you work on the feel and the title, and the uh, because he can't, the guy who founded it came from a. Uh, background where he submitted it and they, they changed his title, completely changed his title, completely yeah. changed everything about, about the whole thing, added chapters that he didn't even know about until it was published. Mm -hmm. they, they wrote mm -hmm. chapters and added them. And he, he just said, you know, I, I didn't have any say so and they own the rights. And so, uh, so he said his company, you own the rights. And I mean, so there's a lot of, so each publishing house is going to be different and you just want to make sure about those things. Do your homework. And then it helps too to ask, I do a lot of sleuthing, like I will follow authors on Instagram, some I know and some I don't know personally, and I will just ask, I'll figure out what their publishing house is or if they do it on their own. But if it's with a publishing house and I may just say, are you happy? How, what has your experience been like? It's usually kind of telltale if they're with ABC publishing house, but then they're looking for something different. Well, if it's going really well, why would you look anywhere else? So that can be a clue. Um, yeah, I do, I do a lot of <laughs> sleuthing too. Um, That's great. And Mary, this has been perfect and, and so helpful. Yeah. Anything else you want to share as we wrap um, and move on to yeah. the next segment? Yeah, just really quick. This is um, unrelated, but I it brought to mind today was a, a non-conventional way of possibly snagging an aid, agent or editor is something on Twitter which is called Faith Pitch. I don't know if anybody's familiar with that or if you've ever heard of it. And I'm loosely Amen. active on Twitter. Have you ever used it? Yeah. Or, yeah. So it's little, it's hosted by, so hashtag Faith Pitch, hosted okay. by Little Lamb Books in Texas. And three times a year from eight in the morning to 8 p.m. at night, Central Time you have the opportunity to share like a, a little back cover or like a, a hook, something you would want, something you would say at an appointment at a conference and editors and agents know that this is faith pitch day and they are looking, but you have to just make sure you use the hashtag. So I would use like a hashtag a for adult. So I'm writing to adult 
And then for me is hashtag RC for romance or contemporary romance, CR for contemporary romance. And all those guidelines are crystal clear on their website. And then you put faith pitch is another hashtag. So it's it's on a particular day, three particular days in the year. Yeah. Yeah. the, the, The third one. So it's February, June and November. So November 12th is the next one coming up. And you just have to realize that, just because it's faith pitch doesn't mean that you might get the attention of strictly Christian agents and editors. Cause I've seen a lot of <laughs> very willing, um, readily available editors and, and they're, or they're looking to acquire and I'm not interested in having a relationship because I look at some of the things they represent and it's not something I would want to be associated with. So it does not, it doesn't hurt anything. You just spend the day, several times throughout the day posting your little blurb and see what happens. So it's, it's harmless and it's free. Well, Mary, thanks so much. And uh, I, I'm really Thank glad to hear all me. that. And I'm going to, I see our second guest is here, Richard Knox. There is you it, are. Do I, do, I, do I jump onto the... <laughs> I'll do, a, uh, I'll do a, the brief introduction that I know about you, but I'd love to hear yeah. more about you and what you do and... Yeah. Uh, Richard Knox, I met at uh, his daughter's wedding uh, at the reception. And uh, in fact, his son in law was here at the house today, and we we're uh, deconstructing a barn and going to re- rebuild it as a theater uh, for next summer and do, do shows here. So I'm excited about that. And so he's been helping me. But I married, uh, I, I didn't marry them, I, mar- I performed the ceremony for his daughter. Officiated. <laughs> Officiated their friends and friends of my kids. And uh, we got to talking and he's the director of sales at Moody Publishing in Chicago. And he sort of told me what that entailed and we started talking books. And so fascinating guy. And uh, Richard, I just asked if he would share from a a big publishing house perspective, what uh, new writers might want to know or learn or how, you know, how they might present themselves or their books or what, how they can prepare uh, if they wanted to pitch to a, a, you know, a large publishing house, but maybe we could back up first. Just tell me a little about, who you are, uh, what you do, and maybe how you got into it. How did you even? Be, how do you become a director yeah. of sales at Moody, and, and why? Well, in my uh, in my college years, I um, went to uh, uh, Northern Illinois and DeKalb, and was involved in Campus Crusade for Christ, which is a campus youth ministry uh, that really impacted me. So I got excited about discipleship, and I was going to go on staff. That was my plan. I was going to go on staff with Crusade and be a disciple maker, and. Uh, but as a as a Christian at a secular college, I was always scouring the shelves for for books that would help me defend my faith in um, in a philosophy class or history class or whatever. The professors at universities are are known to sort of try to uh, deconstruct you to zero so they could build you up in <laughs> in their image. And so, uh, if you were if you were going to oppose that, you had to have a had to have a defensible position. And so, so I was reading books by Francis Schaeffer back in the day, for those of you that are my age. Um, um, and a lot of the books I read were from InterVarsity Press or, or Crossway or, you know, just different. Um, uh, I was an art major of all things, so I'd read books like Modern mm-hmm. Art and Death of a Culture by H.R. Ruckmacher or something like that. Or, you know, the, just books on Christianity and the arts and philosophy and different things. And uh, So I graduated and had excessive school debt, which was only ten grand, but at the time that was excessive. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I got accepted on staff, but they said, hey, go pay down your debt for a year and come back. And I, and, re, and you know, cause you have to raise support. So I was, I was kind of crushed. Um, so I didn't know what I was going to do. And one thing led to another and a friend said, hey, there's an opening at IVP for a sales rep. And I thought, well, I don't want to be a sellout and become a salesman, you know, but it was at something I loved and I like, yeah, I could do that. I could talk about books that I'd read and thought were interesting. So I became a sales rep and, you know, called on Christian bookstores and colleges and you name it. And mm-hmm. one thing led to another and I've been in sales. I've been in publishing, um, mostly in Christian, but I shouldn't say mostly, kind of 50-50 in my career. Um, I've worked for IBP and Crossway um, and Nav Press for a stint and um, a couple of secular publishers. Uh, I worked for Follett, which is a large book distribution company that supplies 80% of the schools in the U S for their library books. Um, mm. I was the, uh, 
I worked for the UK government for six years as a trade officer, and I was the lead US trade officer for publishing. So I would I was the liaison to all the UK publishing companies who wanted to figure out how to sell books in America. And so I'd speak at London Book Fair and Frankfurt Book Fair and Book Expo, which is the big trade show in the US, about how to sell books in America and help British companies figure out distribution partners and find their way over here. Um, Wow, I didn't know all this. This is huge, (laughs) huge amount of background and experience. And so I'm thrilled that you would join me. Thanks. And a a number of years ago, after a hand at being an entrepreneur, like many of you might be, um, I uh, had an opportunity to go to work at Moody Publishers. And I like, I don't know if I want to go to back into the Christian book industry because sometimes they waffle the line of we're a business, we're a ministry, and you don't quite know which side they're going to fall on. And it's, mm-hmm. you know, it's kind of a challenging experience sometimes. And um, mm-hmm. I liked Moody because they had a, a ministry first mentality. It was really about the mission and about, about the impact the books can have on people's lives. And the business part was sort of secondary to that in some ways, but yeah, I like the culture. And so I, I ended up there, hmm. but um, hmm. yeah. And so at Moody, I'm in charge of sales. I'm a part of the leadership team and, and manage our sales team. Um, I'll, t- I'll say a little bit about, about traditional book publishing and my thoughts on it with, with self-published authors and people that would come up to us to, want to get published. There's, there's not a trade show that I've attended uh, or a gathering of humans that I wasn't approached by folks who had a good book. <laughs> and, and so, so me being in this room, I, I'm, I'm a bit uncomfortable to be honest with you. I, uh, you know, I'm a, like a Democrat walking into a Republican convention or, you know, vice, or vice versa. Um, uh, you know, and so um I understand. I understand how you feel about what you've created, invested your heart and soul into, um, but at the same time, I'm kind of on the other side, and the other side says everyone that comes to us has this thing that they've created. And it's their baby, and it's the greatest, and it's the best, and you want it, and that's sort of your attitude or the writer's attitude or anybody who created something. They poured their soul into it. It's theirs. They own it. They think it's great, and I would always say to them, "Well, that may be, but we got." 20 just like it. <laughs> you know? So it's not a matter of how wonderful it is. It's a matter of uh, how do we get the attention of the, of the consumer, the reader, the person you're trying to reach. So in that sense, it's about reach. It's about, it's about um, just sort of audience. And, and how do we bring awareness to your content, the book, assuming it's a, it's like the best thing ever written and it's quality that that's then it, you know, it becomes, well, then how do, how do we elevate it to the point that people find out about it and are interested in it and talk about it and create a, an awareness so that they want to they wanna read it and, and different things. So doing, um, doing great writing and having a good idea and a good writing is, you know, at least gets you, it might get you in the door, but then there's a whole, does it fit? Does it fit with our, mark? can we market it? Can, are you the kind of person we can, you know, I guess there's a lot, there's a lot the, the, even beyond a great idea and a great writing. The, the universe of, of literary, which you hear about in New York with you know, Simon Schuster and Random House and Penguin and, uh, and so forth, of literary novelists um, who, who are first-time novelists and who make a break is, is so <laughs> – it's such a unique, niche, small universe that it's just um, – it's hard to, uh, hard to find your way in, into that. But, um, you know – this will I, it will be encouraging before I'm done. So so hang, so hang, hang with me. Um, yeah, um, one of the challenges that I learned when I was working with um, UK publishers and authors early on was they would come to me and they they would talk about wanting to get into the US and 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 get their books published in the US or even even publishers from from abroad who wanted to sell their books here. Um, they they didn't understand that the publishing industry in America is not one industry; it's like eight. Um, maybe, you know, it's at least six and the industries are, um, just general trade, which is like consumer book sales, like a Barnes and Noble, you know, so there's, there's, there's general trade like Barnes and Noble books, a million, um, you know, that sort of thing, big box retailers. So there, there's the trade, there's, there's the Christian trade, which is a whole nother subset universe with its, you know, with its own world. There's libraries, there's academic, there's special markets. 
uh, and all that that might entail. There's international, there's eBooks and digital platforms of different kinds and several other things that don't come to mind now. But each of these six or seven market segments is an industry unto themselves. So, so that they, um, so for example, take the library market. Uh, it's like segmentation, segmentation. You know, it's like what's the real estate location, 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 and, and and marketing. It's segmentation, segmentation, segmentation. So the library market is actually like four industries. It's school libraries, which is like K twelve libraries. It's it's public libraries. It's academic libraries and it's special libraries. Well, each of those subsets of of the library industry is a different universe. They each they each have their own wholesalers, their own distributors, their own selection processes and criteria, um, their own events, their own audiences, their own gathering, and so forth. So when a uh, an author from the UK would come to me and say, "Hey, I've published this book. It's a three hundred dollar." botany book um the, the the thing i would say to him is like okay well that's not going to go on an end cap at a barnes and noble it's not going to go into life restore so of all of these segments where do you think that's going to who's going to buy that and where are they going to buy it and it's like well it's going to be a professional person who works in that field it's going to be you know an academic person or someone who's studying that um or students and so you kind of quickly go well this book is going to have a life in the library world and in the academic world, it's most likely not going to find its way to a Target or a, or a, a Costco or a Sam's Club or whatever. Um, I'm purposefully leaving out the Amazon equation because that that just sort of is a you know just is so loud a noise that it blocks out everything else. So we'll come to that in a minute. But apart from Amazon, there are all these market segments, um, and so you just need to understand that, like, well. If you're doing a this kind of book, well, this is where it sells, and this is who the audience is. And if you're doing this kind of book, how do I reach that reader? Um, mm -hmm. So if you're doing a K-12 chapter books for, um, say, you know, Magic Treehouse kind of series for kids that are, you know, 8 to 12, well, you're like, okay, well, where do kids' books sell? Who's the main buyer of, you know, um, you know, uh, those chapter book re early readers. Well, it's school libraries. It's, you know, it's general retail trade. Maybe it's homeschoolers. Um, and then you go, okay, well, hey, who, who you know, so th that's where that's going to go. And you think about it that way. But I, every time I'd be in an event, someone would come up to me and go, first they'd make small talk. And then eventually they would come out with, well, what's in their bag, <laughs> which is their manuscript and their, and their, and their bundle, you know, with their, with their sales, their back cover copy and their pitch and whatever it was. And, um, and I, and I always listen to them. And, but my first advice to them always is who's what's already out there that looks like that is similar to what you're writing. So, so if you're writing a book for, you know, 10 year old girls, uh, you know, the babysitters club or whatever you want to call it, or, you know, uh, or if you're writing a book on, um, you know, medieval fiction, or if you're writing a book on, on uh, computer programming, well, find the company. You know, what author do you like? What, what writers do you like? What, you know, what books are comparable? Like right now I have to, tomorrow I have to submit to Ingram, which is the largest book wholesaler in the U S they supply all the retailers and dot coms and all these people, their books. Um, I have to su submit to Ingram my next season of 20 titles and I have to give them in a database all the comps for these titles. So the buyer wants to know, Hey, for each book I'm asking them to consider buying what, what's a comparable book, comparable book that they already have in their system that they already know about that they can look at its performance and say, Oh, you like this book. Um, well, you'll like it because it's like David Platt's book, yada, yada, or, Oh, you like that book by Jen Wilkerson. Well, then you'll like this book because it's, you know, so they want to know comparable titles either from you or from another publisher so they can get a feel for what it is and who the audience is and so forth. Mm -hmm. So all that to say is you, every publisher has their own identity and whether they know it or not, whether they are real conscious of it or not, they have two or three things that they do really well. So if I want a resume book on how to write a resume, I, you know, and 
you know, as, as consumers, we don't know who the publisher is and we don't usually care. I just want a John Grisham book. I don't care if it's Random House or Penguin or whoever. But in reality, um, if you're a buyer at a bookstore or a public library, collection development buyer or whatever, they know that, oh, resume books, that's like workman publishing or, you know, company X. So all that to say is that companies have an identity um, that they're known for thoughtful books that are on the reformed camp spectrum and all their authors are people that are in some, you know, theological camp or tribe or a couple of them. Somebody else does general trade. Somebody else does fiction, you know, like Bethany house. I don't know if you do. Most of you know sort of about Christian publishing. Is this a Christian writing group? Uh, Eric? It is a Christian writer group, but uh, a lot of this is new to all of us. So okay, anything you so, want to share is good. Okay. So the Christian publishing landscape is, 20 independent publishers. Um, what happened, you know, 10, 20 years ago is the big New York publishers, which would be like Random House and Simon Schuster and Penguin and Harper Collins, saw how vibrant the Christian book business was and how many readers and consumers were buying and reading Christian uh, books, fiction, nonfiction, whatever. Um, and so they either built their own Christian book division. So Random House created Waterbrook Press out in Colorado Springs and somebody else created Faith Words in Nashville and somebody else, you know, so, so they either built their own Christian book division mm -hmm. or they just purchased them. So Harper Collins, which had owned Zondervan for years and kind of let them do their thing. Um, then bought Thomas Nelson, which was a, a big legacy publisher in Nashville. And so now it's Harper Christian, which is Thomas Nelson Zondervan and, and Harper's religious group under that. When you say there's 20 independent ones, is, does yeah. Moody like its own? It doesn't, it doesn't, it's not owned by anybody else. Or are you talking about 20 independent, meaning Harper Collins, Zondervan? No, I know. I mean, like, I mean, like Tyndale or, or Baker. Or, Those are specifically uh, Christian houses and they're they not owned Christian. by anybody else. Right. They're independently family owned. And Moody and would be the same. Moody, Moody. What's interesting is there are a number of large organizations and ministries over the years that created publishing arms to pr promote the purpose of that organization. So make resources for that organization, whatever. Moody Publishers was created like 120 years ago by D.L. Moody to make affordable Christian books for um, families and, uh, uh, you know, young believers in the city of Chicago specifically, and then, and then beyond that. So we have a long history, but we're part of the Moody Bible Institute in Chicago, which also is a, a college that trains a few thousand people a uh, semester. And then we have Moody Radio, which is a broadcast media group. Um, but we're, we're fairly independent even within in that. But there are companies like InterVarsity Press that's owned by InterVarsity Christian Fellowship, which is a campus ministry ultimately. The Navigators, another campus ministry, created Nav Press, and that was around for 30, 40 years. Um, Nav Press is now sort of a division of Tyndale, but... Uh, Tyndale Publishing was created by Ken Taylor, um, who wrote the Living Bible, you know, um, and grew a publishing division that's quite significant now. Um, Broadman Holt, and then there are publishing companies that were divisions of denominations. So B&H Publishing, or Lifeway, is are the publishing arms of the Southern Baptist Convention, you know, um, denomination, that sort of stuff. Anyway, just to get back to the application point is, Whatever the book that you have, find the books out in the marketplace that are the most like what you've written. Granted, your thing is unique and different and nothing is like it. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll grant that. But there are things that, that would appeal to the, So who's going to read your book? What are they already reading? So if you say, hey, my book's like this, you know, what are, what are the people or who's your ideal target reader? Who's your ideal target audience? What, you know, who is that person that, that you are convinced is the person you're writing this book for? Well, what are they already reading? Um, and then you kind of get a sense of that and go, okay, well, who publishes that? Well, if, if you, you come up with a list of five books from different authors that, that um, you think is, you know, that your core reader, your core target customer or audience is, then you say, oh, right, well, who publishes those books? And then you find out that three of the five or all five of them are published by the same company. Well, that's probably who you should <laughs> prayerfully, hopefully align with. Oh, the that's, problem really, is, that's really helpful, Richard. Yeah, that's perfect. Yeah, that's, yeah. That's, a, that's a great way to position your book. Look at the, the problem is if you don't, um, if you don't, even if you get published somewhere else, your book has the potential to be an orphan 
in their line. So uh, if you're a, a fiction author and you go to a publisher that, that doesn't really do fiction or it's not a high priority for them or they don't, they don't do it well um, and they're doing 80% of their stuff, you know, adult, you know, adult uh, nonfiction or Christian living or whatever, um, they might be happy to have you because it's a great thing and they might put some energy behind it. But it's like coals in a fire. There's not enough coals to keep the flame hot enough, you know, to make it to make it grow. Um, so anyway, just just I would say that's the main thing. Did you share with them that um, ECPA link by any chance that I sent you? Uh, I haven't shared it, no. But I I can share it if you want me to here. You no, know, we can. Yeah, um, just see if you can find that. But um, so one of the things I would encourage is to just learn about the publishing industry. And first question is like, hey, why do I need to get published? Uh, why do I need to be with the traditional publisher versus do it myself? And that's what many of you talk about. Um, uh, you can certainly profitably be a self-published author, very successful and make your way in the world uh, and not need a publisher. Um, especially if you're, you know, people have talked about what you give up when you go, when you sign with the publisher, you're right. It becomes their book. Mm-hmm. And the, the, but the trade-off is they're going to do exponentially more than you could ever do with it. That's the whole, that's the whole point of publishing. Um, they have 1500 titles um, in their bag um, versus the one or five that you have. And um, that critical mass gets them in front of people who wouldn't see you otherwise, other than, other than Amazon. And then if you sign with Amazon, you're completely at there. Um, you know, much of what they do is um, exclusivity as well. So, I have a, a good friend, his name is Brian Gadawa, um, who's written some fantasy fiction, kind of Game of Thrones Christian fiction, for lack of a better word. Um, and he almost got published by HarperCollins, and they pulled the plug and he did it himself. And he's making six figures, but he's on book, I don't know, 12 or 15, <laughs> you know. Um, and like any writer, it takes a few to, to get that and does a lot of marketing. Yeah, bring that back up again, Eric. and. Um, uh, scroll to the bottom of it there. That's good. Uh, right there. So the ECPA is the Evangelical Christian Publishers Association. Now, forgive me if I'm saying stuff you already know. Um, but so this is the trade association for the Christian publishing universe. Um, and they run a writer's workshop at least once a year. But what's interesting is you can go to this website, you can go to the ecpa.org and there's a wealth of information on that, on how to find an agent, how to, how to, uh, basically how to get published. Um, you just have to s- navigate the site and search around. But one of the things when you click on it, it brings you to, um, this writing workshop here called the art of writing. And I just thought this was great at the bottom of it. I saw these links and icons of organizations who are sponsoring this event. And you can click on all these, and there's a lot of really helpful stuff there. <laughs> so you mm-hmm. talked about the iFaith thing. Um, but here you have links to printers and writing, other writing groups and distributors and wholesalers. And so it's a great way to learn about the industry um, of writing, the business of writing, as well as, you know, here's the, I don't know, Jerry Jenkins Writers Guild or crazyforfiction.com. Or, you know, I, I haven't, I haven't read these or vetted them, but um, writer fest. So, so there's a lot of links here that are helpful. Um, But I'll tell you as a publisher, um, and I'll I'll kind of try to end with this, and then I'll open for a few questions is um, we don't accept unsolicited manuscripts. Mm -hmm. And you might go, well, that's horrible. What's the point? (laughs) What's the point of that? Well, um, mostly we're a bit unique in that um, we, we, deal with agents. And so the agents bring projects to our editors, but probably half to two thirds of what we publish are self sourced. So basically our acquisition editors, our AEs, we call them our acquisition editors, um, each have a niche that they're responsible for. One does core evangelical readers, one does women's, one does leaders and, you know, pastor theologians, one does uh, ministry partnerships. And so we, attend events and we go to conferences and we hear speakers and we're out taking, getting a pulse on who the people are that are speaking, talking, writing, blogging, podcasting, you know, on topics that we think are really important. Um, 
So a lot of how, what we acquire is our, our acquisition editors at events and at things will hear people and go, that was amazing. They're really talented. Um, I wonder if they, you know, and then it begins to build from there. Um, so when we, when we, so they'll find an author, they'll find a book project and they'll bring it to a committee that I sit on. And as a committee, we, we ask questions like, well, who's it for? What's unique about it? Um, does the author have a platform? And as much as I hate that, um, because I'm a, I'm a literate, a literary buff. I'm like yourself and I, and I value art and good, good, beautiful work. The first, one of the top questions is, do they have a following? Mm -hmm. uh, do they have a social media platform? Do they have a website? Are they known for speaking and talking and writing about what it is that they're claiming to be an expert in, especially in the case of nonfiction? So, you know, if you're writing a book on financial peace or whatever, well, you better be talking to people, speaking at events, creating, creating a buzz, demonstrating that your information is valuable and that you have some, something behind you mm -hmm. that would make me want to buy your book. Um, so if, if you're writing a book on counseling, um, and my choice is I can buy yours or I can buy one from, you know, um, uh, David Jeremiah or you know, Alistair Begg or Tony Evans or, you know, um, um, Lisa Turkhurst or whoever, name it. Um, there's back to my original model about it's the greatest, it's the best you want it. No, it isn't. We got 10 just like it. Well, there's a lot of noise and there's a lot of competition, a lot of clutter. And so you have to define your voice, your message, what's unique that gives you credibility. And when you demonstrate that you are someone that people are listening to, that gets agents attention, that gets editors attention. Mm -hmm. um, so when they hear you speaking somewhere or they read your podcast, your, your blog, or they hear you as a guest on someone's podcast talking about a topic that you're informed and excited about, um, that, that opens up the doors and gets things going. So we'll publish books by people who don't, who aren't big on social media. Um, but it better be a very, very good book and they better have some endorsements from people that know them and they better have had some experience, you know, vetting and proving that what they, their craft, whether it's, if it's fiction, writing articles, writing, you know, what, I don't know. Does, is this making sense or? That's perfect. Cause I have, I've sometimes wondered, should I self publish or am I giving things away and maybe I should wait and try to find a publisher but in some cases, or, and a lot of times, it's just better even to get your stuff out there, get your word out there, get, build up your email list, build up your presence, be known for your field. I think that's what yep. I'm hearing. Yep. Uh, you know, you build a platform, and you know, the more you write, the more you'll be more credible. And Amen. I'd never argue. I'd never argue against self-publishing, um, in a sense of if you can do it, and and you can figure out a channel that, to just get your work out into the world and your and your words out into the world, whether you're writing for publications or online sites or you're actually writing books that you're selling um uh you know through different different channels and you can find some distributor to pick it up or um in you know back in the day we called them vanity presses because you know you you wrote a book about your story and you had to pay somebody five hundred a thousand dollars to to make a couple a couple hundred copies and they gave them and you put them in a box in your trunk and uh that you know and that was all that came of it you know um but with the, you know, with the channels and the opportunities on the web, you know, you can, you can, I mean, much of what sells on Amazon um, is really, is, it's, it's interesting when traditional book sales kind of start declining on Amazon, but in reality, the pool was just getting bigger and they were pouring more and more low cost, self-published content into the bucket. <laughs> so it just diluted the bucket. It wasn't, it wasn't that there was less demand for um, uh, published works by established companies and houses. It was just the, they just, you know, there was just buckets of buckets of self-published stuff coming in at four ninety nine and five ninety nine and three ninety nine and uh, whatever. Um, so, but, but we do, we do look at, it is really common for people to find something that was self-published and maybe they sold a couple thousand copies and that gets an editor at uh, publishing company's attention. Um, but so the benefit of a, being with the publishing company is they have 50 people, a hundred people that are out presenting your book in all of those seven channels I talked about. 
not just to what you can reach from your desktop. So, and you couldn't get, you couldn't get the attention of a buyer at, at Google play or, or, or iBooks or, you know, um, you know, they, anybody, you know, it was like they wouldn't even buy small publishing companies because they would rather you come through some larger aggregator that makes it worth their time. So, so sometimes it's just reach. So getting your book into retail still exists, believe it or not, uh, <laughs> you know, um, and uh, it's, and it's always and you're cool. still doing a good business, I assume, getting books into big box stores. You get them into WalMarts and Costco's and things like that. So you're, that's do. that's your sort of your role, right? And uh, everywhere but, and anywhere. So whether it be okay. to book chains in the UK, Australia, South Africa, Barnes and Noble, Books a Million, Hudson's, airport stores, Choice Books, Spinner Racks, you know, okay. um, schools, libraries, you know, you name it. But, hey, so, any questions that they have? Professionally, I'm in sales. I sell software. Yep. Is there such a thing as an independent bookseller? Someone that actually takes indie author stuff, collects it up, does the comps, and, and, and you know, on a commission, paid basis, whatever, actually sells to bookstores and stuff like that. Is, it, does that type of person exist in the industry? I think, Eric, really, right when I, you know, came on, you were mentioning a, a publishing company. That is actually one of these kind of companies. Morgan James. Uh, yeah, Morgan James. I mean, there are a dozen companies like Morgan James um, that will publish. I don't want to say they'll publish anything, uh, but but you know, you sort of. I don't know. Do you pay to work with Morgan James, Eric? Uh, you have to buy twenty five hundred copies of the book yourself. Yeah. But so yeah, you're so. you're paying something, but they they do a lot of the heavy lifting, and uh, yeah. and then they have a distribution network, so they can get it into into bookstores for you. So you're paying, so there's, a, there's an there's, avenue. There's, a, but. Yeah, there's a dozen, there's probably six or eight companies like that um, all across the landscape that um, will publish your book. will will put it in a catalog with a bunch of other self published books um, and give it an input, but it looks like you're published by Morgan James or it looks like right. you're published by spark notes or it looks like you're published by, you know what you're basically just joining a publishing company that, welcomes with open arms independent authors and are willing to publish you because you're willing to cover the risk of printing, you know, their initial print run. Um, but you know, yeah. Okay. I was just curious because at this point I'm about to hire a college student on commission to go around and (laughs) sell for me. Right. But anyway. Yeah. Um, right. Yeah, and that's been my hope too. I wish I, I wish I had. Some, I've written thirty books, and I wish I had someone out there just able to work the streets. And I'm glad for them to take a commission or whatever. But I, I just don't know who those people are that I could hire, or, or is it a publicist that we would need? Maybe more than you know, you that know, would get us on radio and get us marketing. That's not a bad. That's not a bad idea. That's a great topic for another. I think that's a topic for a whole session. Is you know what's the value of publicity, and depending on if it's nonfiction, especially. Um, a publicist could do it, could help set up a campaign around your book. If the topic is timely, if the topic is interesting, that um, radio stations, podcasts, blogs um, uh, would want to uh, uh, talk, you know, give you a few minutes on or that sort of thing. And as a result, people would hear about it and word of mouth would spread. And then they'd go to, um, you know, Amazon or um, Barnes and Noble.com or wherever they buy books, CBD or you name it. Um, and um, and look for your book um, mm-hmm. Great. or your your own website. Um, um, I think I think the six, a lot of successful independent publishers are really building their own platform on your own website and learning how to market yourself um, uh, using Facebook or using different social media um, things. You know, to build a following and get reviews and um, and uh, offer things. So you have to become a marketer of your own your own brand, your own site not just a single title, but that too. Yeah. Other questions around the room here? Eric, I, I'll offer this. If anyone, if anyone wants to, I, I hesitantly do it, but I'd be happy to um, let you share my, uh, my uh, email with the team and I'll be happy to, to um, this mm-hmm. lovely group of uh, 14, uh, uh, <laughs> provide any, answer any questions and, uh, you know, point you in a, okay. A, dr- a more specific direction or two if, if uh, there's an interest. So. That's super nice of you. And I will uh, just post this in the chat room and 
This will be exclusive to those who are here live. Uh, you can read it in the chat room. And Richard, I so appreciate you coming. And uh, my final question for you is, uh, you mentioned how everybody has a book idea or everybody yeah. you know, that you meet. And uh, it, do you... Uh, do you do you wish wish people wouldn't approach you, or do you think it's it's good that people approach you? You know, I mean, when we had a chat, I told you about yeah. a few of my books. Oh, he said that one sounds really interesting, and I'd love I would to say be just direct right from the start. Don't don't be shy, don't be hesitant. Just be direct from the start, and part of the time is that you're talking to the right people. So mm -hmm. you know, if you're talking to the guy whose job is to like, you know, run the printing press, well, he's not going to be someone that can help you, nor that does he want to spend time talking to you about it. Um, so, you know, understanding who it is that you're talking with, if you're at a at an event or if you go to a convention and there's publishers all over and you kind of just walk up to the booth and kind of cold call a few and give out some packets, um, you know, it it's more it's more just, you know, um, finding out if they have – take that approach that I said to begin with of, like, you should already know the publishers. Out of 20 publishers, these are the three that really – should publish my book because they already have things like that and they would be, they'd be a great fit for me and, mm -hmm. and, 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 you know, present, you know, walk up to them or uh, mm -hmm. contact them or send them your manuscript. And, um, or as you look for an, an agent, let an agent rep you temporarily and just say, Hey, these are the three publishers that I think uh, my stuff would really go well with. What do you think? And, and um, just to get your foot in the door. Um, mm -hmm. but, yeah. Do your homework. Yeah, do your homework and and be real and like just be real kind and direct about hey, um, uh, I'm an author and I'm I'm looking for a, a publishing company. Um, is there someone I could send a manuscript to? Um, most of them will say no thanks, but that's just that first. That's just part of the game and part of the hurdle. Um, but if they find if you just talk and you know they're interested, um, then it, you, you don't know. God will open doors for you. So. Oh, that's super, super. Thank you so much, Richard. I really appreciate it. You're welcome to stick around if you want. We're going to talk about YouTube channels and a friend of mine who's just passed 200,000 subscribers on her YouTube channel, New Ways to Reach People. Thank Thanks you. for your Thanks time. Richard. Thank appreciate you so it. much. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you so much. You bet. I want to say hello to Murphy. Hi. Hey, <laughs> nice to meet you, Mary. You too. You too. I just want to know how you read so very, very many books. <laughs> I'm just amazed. Oh, I do thank you. Book reviewers, I think that's what they do all day long is just read <laughs> blogs, it's, wherever, whatever the avenue is. And it's incredible. Yeah, it is. It, reading is a very big part of my day. It's, I feel very blessed that I have a career where I can call it part of my job. <laughs> yeah, I'm working, right? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that's super. Murphy Napier, it's so good to see you. And it is also your birthday today. If everybody wants to say happy birthday. Uh -huh. uh, happy it's birthday. so nice of you to spend your time with us. And uh, we'll be recording this too. And so people will be able to watch it later. But uh, I met uh, Murphy when she was uh, very little. And she, we were uh, they were homeschooled kids with my homeschooled kids and uh, became good friends. And we became friends with parents and family, and I got to perform the ceremony of her wedding uh, down at her lovely uh, grandparents' home at that time. And uh, oh, it was just a great, great day. But I, I love her, love her uh, heart for God. And uh, she has uh, published a, a, a self-published a book of her own that's called Perfection. I don't know if you're even pitching this to people anymore, but <laughs> I, I, we started talking about books uh, at one point because you said, I'd like to... You know, put this book out. We started talking about publishing on Amazon and just how that process worked. And you did it. And I read the book and I, I loved it. And just a great idea. Mm -hmm. I mean, you review books all the time, but my review for the book was just, you know, she had this uh, idea of, you know, what if a girl could choose between a perfect <laughs> boyfriend who just uh, everything he did right and he responded the right way, but he was pre-programmed to do that. Or you could have someone who was uh, natural and could choose to love you or not love you or had imperfections. And so uh, which would you rather choose? And as you go through the book, you can sort of see this debate going on. It's like, mm, they're only pre-programmed, but I really like that. Or, <laughs> oh, they're so imperfect, but I really like that they choose to love me from time to time. And it's, it's a great uh, study in 
of relationships. And I, I, I thought it had great plot lines and she didn't let anyone read it until it actually, even her husband, until it came out. And she kept this very private. And I know you're working on sequels, but you not only did that, but then you, uh, you, you went on and you started doing a YouTube channel and reviewing other people's books. And uh, I just saw you pass 200,000 subscribers. I don't know if that was in the last few weeks. That jump number has jumped from, I think earlier this year, you just passed 100,000. So anyway, but that's my little intro to you. But could you tell us a little more about you, who you are? You know, I'm sure, you know, being a mother of young children makes it easy to read books and do your own business. And, you know, you're... <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, I think you covered most of it. I, I have the channel that I run. I do, I critique manuscripts for authors. I was narrating audiobooks for a while. We're in the process of adoption. It's just, it's, it's a busy life, but, um, it, I love it. You know, I, I have always, always loved books. They've seemed just as real to me as reality is. And, you know, characters are people that I know and that I've spent time with and worlds are places that I've visited. And, um, you know, writing for me is, it's more of a hobby that I like to put, I like to share with people. Um, but for me, everything that I've pursued, the fact that I get to live my life surrounded by reading and surrounded by readers and writers is, I just feel like I'm living the dream really. Mm. So you feel that's even a stronger thing than being a writer. You, you just love the, the whole process of reading and reviewing. I just love books, man. Books, I just, I, I, I love literature so much and I enjoy reading it. I enjoy writing it. I think I get the same amount of enjoyment out of both. Um, and just like being surrounded in it, pretty much everything, all my hobbies, everything that I try to pursue in, in regards to work, it's just all surrounded in books because it's just, so alive every time I pick up a book. Mm, mm. And tell me, did you accidentally stumble into this YouTube idea or did you intentionally go after this with a, or a combination? Uh, yeah, I guess a combination. I, I was intentional about starting my channel. Of course, I never dreamed it would really grow. I, I, I expected to have, you know, a small community of people that I could just chat books with. And, um, you know, it, it did grow. And, and I didn't pursue the growth so much. Uh, but I'm very, very grateful for it. I was actually very afraid of growth, mm. <laughs> because the internet is a scary place. But um, I just feel like, man, like God's just blessed me so much. And I have this amazing community of people uh, that are just so I mean, 200,000 people you'd think you'd have some stinkers in there. And I do. But for the most part, it's such an encouraging and kind and wonderful environment. Mm. Uh, and I feel, I feel so blessed. That's super. And of course, we're a book, a book group. So we're all writers. A lot of us are new, uh, newly or just trying to break into writing and getting our message out there. But I just thought that YouTube is just a, a whole new channel. And just, you know, I, I shared earlier, I don't know if you were on, but, you know, just that I've, it, it took me 25 years to build up to 22,000 subscribers on my email list that I could write to every week and talk about whatever and uh, talk about my faith, but talk about, you know, different topics. And and somehow, I don't even know when you started your channel, but, you know, it's it's been a short time and you're up, you know, you're 10 times beyond what I have done. <clears throat> but you're reaching people every day with your message. And that's what I love. I uh, I jumped into YouTube just this year as a really trying to intentionally do this and say, you know, I'll just read my book. You know, I love writing and I love you know, love that I can reach people. So I just, you know, and in July, I did a Christmas in July and just read through my whole St. Nicholas book, you know, 25 nights of Christmas. And then er, the month earlier I did, you know, 40 or 50 nights of uh, well, a month or two. I did of this bedtime stories of faith, a book that I had written and just prayed with people and talked with people and played the piano and, uh, I just found that YouTube and Facebook Live and stuff, it, it gave me a new opportunity to reach people with my message. And so maybe you could talk a little about that, you know, what year you started and uh, just, you know, what do you feel like you're able to reach people or, what, you know, do you have a purpose? You, you've sort of talked about just just being a, a commu having a community of people that want to want to talk about books. But uh, I guess, is there any Christian perspective underlying this as well? A Christian oh, yeah. view and some intentionality about, uh, getting that message out. So absolutely, uh, it, it it's a bit more subtle 
because I have a lot of I have I have a lot of beneath the surface stuff that I I try to accomplish and that I dream about. Um, so I, I, I initially began my channel because I loved reading and I loved writing and I wanted reading to be less solitary and I wanted to chat with readers about books I was reading. Um, I started it four and a half years ago, you asked me that, and, and because I wanted to share what I was writing and it's been effective for that purpose. Um, I, think, I think a big part of my growth is just that people see that I'm just excited to chat about books and, <laughs> and that that makes people excited to chat about books, right? It makes people want to stick around and, and hang out and talk about books. Um, I am openly Christian on my channel, but I don't have a lot of videos dedicated exclusively to you know, Christian nonfiction, or I do have some, but not a lot. Um, and the reason is because my goal with my channel is to be a reader and a writer and to hang out with other readers and writers. But also, I try to present myself in a very authentic, and I do my best <laughs> to present myself very honestly and vulnerably. Um, and then I keep avenues open. I have a Discord server that people can join and chat with me personally. My email is open. Um, my private messaging is open. And I get a lot of messages, <laughs> and it's a lot to keep up with. But it's a priority to me to keep up with these things because I do get a lot of messages from people who have had similar life experiences to me, who have gone through similar things that I have, who um, relate to things that I have opened up about, and they come to me seeking advice. And this is my opportunity one-on-one -on -one to minister. Mm. And so a lot of my ministry isn't so overt. It's not necessarily me giving a sermon online, which is nothing wrong with, of course, but I have a very wide reach doing it this way. And then when people who trust me and trust my personality um, and trust the kindness that they see in me, they come to me um, and I'm able to help them maybe take one step closer, right? Um, also, the channel has been good for us monetarily. And through that, Corey and I are funding the adoption, but also through that, um, we plan on starting a ministry with our church that we should hopefully be able to fund fully ourselves, which is something that I'm just <laughs> so ridiculously grateful for, wow. um, that, we, that God has given us this blessing and this opportunity that I can work a job that I love working and that I look forward to every single day. And that has given us the extra income that we can help our community more. That is super nice. I'm sure people are interested in this. What are the way, what are the sources of funding? Can, if you can share just what, you know, is this YouTube advertising or you know, how, how does the, Oh, okay. What's what, where, the, does the the, monetary, where does the monetary I'm... come in? Yeah. Or how does that, yeah. Um, are so you, selling, are I, you selling like tons of books of perfection or? Some it, of it is through my writing. It, it, it is partially through my writing. Um, I, so AdSense is a big part of making money on YouTube. Um, videos have ads at the beginning and the end of the video, sometimes in the middle of the video and advertisers pay YouTube for that ad spot. And then YouTube pays us a portion of that. Um, for making the content that brings the advertiser, advertisers in. And you don't um, necessarily have to do anything for that. You you just have a popular channel and they just, YouTube just adds that on and they deposit money. Oh, yeah. And not. So yeah, it's not I like you're looking for that. Okay. No, I don't, I don't seek out advertisers. I don't speak to advertisers unless I'm doing a sponsorship, which I do those because it's just, you so know, So this is more. a second way, the sponsorship. Right. So the AdSense is specifically about ads. And all, all that was for me was monetizing my channel because I had enough views that I qualified to monetize. YouTube you, does everything else. And you click a button and you say, sure, put ads on and pay me royalties for that. So the more yep. popular you get, the more ads you show, and then you get paid. All right. Yeah. So you're paid based off of your CPM, which just means... Um, I have a high CPM because I don't swear on my channel. I don't... Um, cover really sensitive topics and I'm not controversial. I just talk about books. And CPM um, is clicks per minute or clicks per something? Million, I think. Okay. So, I really, so how many clicks? I don't know. If people click an ad, you get paid. Okay. Well, not just click ads, just watch my videos and an oh, okay. ad plays. Okay. Uh, click click on my video. So I'll click on um, your video. Okay. Yeah. And I actually I think it's thousand. Like 
clicks per thousand views. I don't, I'm sorry, I don't know. Um, but I have a high CPM, so I get a high rate of return uh, because I have a decent channel. And um, I post anywhere between four to five videos a week usually. Um, so I am working to put out the content, but I don't have to do anything to get paid other than just saying, yes, I want ads on my video. You show up um, four or five videos and how long are your videos typically? Usually they hit around 15 or 20 minutes. Okay. Okay. All right. Okay. Yeah. Go on. So then there's uh, sponsorships too. Sponsorships. Actually... Yeah. So companies reach out to me and say, Hey, we want to sponsor a video. Um, this is super common. <laughs> I don't work with very many sponsorships because it can be hard to find a good relationship with a company that works well with you. So I'm exclusive with two companies. I do three sponsorships a month. They pay me a certain amount to make an ad and put it in my video. It's really straightforward and easy. Um, let's see. I have a Patreon, which my subscribers can join my, my Patreon. They're a patron. So then they get extra content from me and they pay for that extra content. Uh, I do affiliate links. So any books that I talk about, I link in the description. And then if they buy that book through my affiliate link, I get a cut. So you make money if you sell your own book or sell somebody else's book. You're going to mm -hmm. make money either way. Okay. And mm -hmm. then you critique books. You get paid mm -hmm. for reading people's books and... Uh, and giving them feedback. Giving them helping feedback. Them, yeah, okay. helping them with like plotting. And if there are plot holes, character development, characters arcs, uh, dialogue that's clunky, stuff like that. Um, and then I try to point out things that aren't flowing well and then try to work with them on how to get it okay. in a better way. Um, so yeah, that's another, nice. but that's, that's a part from the channel. That's something and that you were, I do freelance. And, and you were narrating books too for like audible and you just sign up as a narrator and then you, if people want you, they yep. did that. And yep. I saw you, I saw, I don't know if your website's still current, but it said you were like booked for a year already for, for critiquing books. So you're not taking a new critique. So. Yeah. I'm, I saw you were just shutting off having people <laughs> even send books to you. You're going to close your PO box because yeah. you've got so many books, you don't have room for them anymore. But yeah. So you you the popularity has a price too though, doesn't it? But, but, <laughs> but you'll be able to fund a lot of things. You're able to do a lot of things and you get to do what you love. I yeah, absolutely. That. I love it. It's wonderful. How would someone start? They just want to, they've never done a YouTube channel before. Is there a simple way to just say, I could start by doing this? Is there any suggestion there? Oh, yeah. I mean, uploading a, a video to YouTube is ridiculously easy. Um, you, won't, you won't get monetized right away. I, I've had my channel for four and a half years, and I think I've been paid for maybe two years tops, and I've been paid well for a year tops. Okay. Um, so it, it, it takes time and my channel has grown much faster than your average channel does. So do it for the passion of it <laughs> as opposed for the monetary side of it. Otherwise you'll quit before you get to the monetary side of it. Um, but it is a great resource. Uh, there's booktube, which is what I'm a part of readers, reviewers, chatting with other readers. And then there's author tube, which is also very popular, and that's writers discussing writing, giving writing tips, talking about their manuscript, um, uh, sharing pieces of their work. And AuthorTube is a really supportive environment where a lot of authors try to find each other and support each other's work, buy each other's books, uh, hype each other up, get each other's name out there. So having an AuthorTube channel is a great choice if you want to get your name out there a little bit more. I've never um, heard of that. So I just searched for author tube. Yeah. You can just search author tube and you'll find a bunch of author tubers. Okay. Um, uh, Bethany Atazada, I narrated her audiobook, and she's so sweet. Uh, probably the biggest author tuber is Jenna Moresi. She does use a lot of language though. So I don't know if you guys want to watch okay. her, but Bethany is Christian. So you'll probably yeah. enjoy her content. And mechanically, you just, I mean, you just log on to YouTube to do this. You just log on to YouTube just using your own, you know, your email address or whatever. And then you click upload video and that's your, ch your channel becomes created almost instantly. Right. And then, yeah. And, and then you can just keep uploading email, uh, YouTube videos to that channel, which is. Yeah. Which you can upload a video a day if you want to. Uh, there, there are other factors. 
like I said, you won't be monetized right away. You have to have a certain amount of watch hours accumulated first. Um, And before, when you're not monetized, it's harder to grow because YouTube doesn't promote videos that they can't make money on. So growth in the beginning can be difficult, but if you connect with other author tubers by leaving comments or by um, just reaching out to them, not to say, hey, promote me, please, but just to make relationships, then growth can a lot of times come a lot more easily. Um, and and a, a lot of people, especially in our in the book world, don't care about numbers. Uh, most of my friends have under 5,000 subscribers, and I shout them out all the time on my channel, and they always get a boost when that happens. So, you know, friends want to help friends. So just make some friends if this is something that would interest you. And it's a great way to get your books out there. It definitely, definitely, definitely helps to get your books out there. And you would say it also helps sell your own books like perfection or I don't, I don't know if you even talk about that much or do you just talk about other people's books or do you mix in your own sometimes? Uh, I, so with my writing, I've actually moved it all to my Patreon and oh. um, yeah, it's, it's one of the tiers, one of the levels of being so they can Patreon. read your writing over on Patreon if they want to pay a monthly. Right. Monthly. So um, it's a $10 tier and they pay $10 a month and I give them a short story every month for that as well as a mm. writing vlog oh. and then one full novel a year. And it's great for me because again, writing is more of a hobby for me with perfection. I wish I hadn't self published it because it's more of a hobby. I didn't, it wasn't ready for it to be published and to be, be viewed as a published book. Mm. I do hope to publish someday, uh, but I'm doing it. I'm, I want to be ready this time. <laughs> That's so, an interesting perspective. Just charge $10 a month and you can get a short story and one novel a year. And that's yeah. super. I hadn't heard yeah. of that model at all. That's, you know, we just were listening to Richard Knox from Moody and that's a whole different way. And it's really hard to break in, but you could set up yes. a Patreon today. Yes. Yes. And if you have any kind of following, they're invested in you. They care about you. They want to hear your stories. And this is a way for them to constantly be getting content from you and you to constantly be getting feedback in a safe environment so that you can continually, oh, wow, that's, that's a criticism I get several times. Maybe I can make these shifts, make these changes to make your writing stronger and to keep your audience because they're constantly getting new material from you. Um, and then for me, after I've done this for a while, then I'd like to go publish because then I feel like I'll have honed my skills a little bit more. Yeah. And I'm thinking, Aaron, you know, your, yours, yours is a great series that could be published monthly. You know, you, you've got a, you know, fantasy world series that you do. And, you know, rather than waiting until your whole book's done, you could just publish a, a, a section a month and, you know, charge oh, yeah, you could do it people if and, you wanted and just to. Yeah, do sort of a serial like, uh, and this is a way a lot of the authors, you know, they'd be published in the Saturday Evening Post and they would just write their book as they went. And Serial publishing is coming back around. It's getting more popular again. Is that kind of your thing, uh, Murphy, is is for your Patreon? You're waiting till you have more completed things and then putting that all out at once? Yeah, so what I do with my, for me, it's short stories. It's not so much serial publishing. Okay. So, but what you could do if, if this were something that you were interested in is you could write for a while and get your material complete and then publish it serially. Mm-hmm. And as it's being published serially month to month, you'll be working on your next section and you'll have right. the next section completely finished. So it's not disjointed and then publish it back to back while you're working on the next section. And again, it gives you a safe space for critical yet positive feedback because a review, I'm sure you guys have heard this, a review is is truly for the readers, not the writers. Because a review is a reader saying, this was my experience with the book. Anybody else that's interested in the book, here's some things to look out for. Here are some of the things that you may like or dislike. That doesn't mean writers can't read reviews, but it's not written for the writer. But in this environment, they're writing to the writer. So instead of saying, this part sucked. This author did a terrible job. Instead, they'll be able to say, I didn't love this. Here's exactly why. So that you can take that feedback and use it usefully instead of just feeling beat down. Yeah. Interesting. I I love this idea. If you publish on Patreon, do you still own the rights? Yes. So Patreon isn't a publisher. All, all its purpose is, is, 
you get extra content from a creator, whatever that looks like. So for me, I download it into a PDF and I upload the PDF on Patreon. So it completely belongs to me and they're getting a piece of my work, but I've not self-published it. I've not published it. I've not done anything with it except essentially shared it with friends who happen to be paying for, for the, the service. Um, so you're still free. Like there's, there's some discussion about how if you self-publish first, then it might be more difficult for you to go with a publisher because now the publisher can't say this is a debut or can't say this is the first time it's been published, right? And I don't, mm -hmm. I don't know how big of a deal that is. But if you were to go this route, and I'm not saying you have to, there's lots of different routes you could go. But if you were to go this route, you wouldn't have that stumbling block because it's completely yours and it's not been published anywhere. Thank you. You're welcome. That's great. And Murphy, what was, uh, what was your... Uh episode that uh, sort of shot you into the stratosphere would you say or, or i know a lot of this is just algorithms and all that kind it of is. stuff but, but there was I, I i think there was an episode that sort of yeah i had i had um let's see i think i had two major boosts for my channel the first one was harry potter unpopular opinions <laughs> <laughs> I think just because the second Fantastic Beast had just come out and people were un unhappy and I had just published that. I didn't even know the movie had come out and, uh, <laughs> and it just happened to work really well with the algorithm. And the algorithm said, Hey, people are clicking on this. I'm going to shove it down people's throats. And it like, I got so many comments of people saying, okay, YouTube, I clicked, stop telling me to click on it. Um, and then the next video was I did a fantasy um, beginner to uh, advanced guide of, I did it with a friend of mine who's a big fantasy reader as well. And we took all of our favorite fantasy series that we talked about a lot on our channel. And we said, here's a good place to begin. Here's a good intermediate. Here's, you know, advanced. Don't start here. And we just compiled all these series and, and ranked them like that. And I don't know why, but the algorithm went wild with it. And in both of those, I remember with the Harry Potter one, I had just hit 10,000 subscribers, which took me about three years to get there. And then in less than a month, I was at 30,000. Mm. And it was just, it was just not, not <laughs> easy. A boost is hard on your mental health, but it was good <laughs> overall. And when we're talking about algorithms, uh, it's just uh, the computer, you know, Google's, the way they present videos to people is sort of based on you know certain factors and so that's called an algorithm how what are those factors and we don't always know what those are yeah but, we don't know, it might be because fantastic beast came out and because you were talking about unpopular harry potter and you were you know and then some harry potter people from other channels or blogs started telling their harry potter friends and so you you jumped into a network of you know, yeah. a big writer's group or a reader's group uh, that really cared about that topic or the same with fantasy or whatever. So, uh, you know, in, in some ways I would, I would, you know, how, how do you make that jump? You know, the recommendation would be put out a lot of content and you just, you just keep putting out content and content that you think people would care about content that matters content. Yeah. That... I think a big, so my friend just hit 200,000 as well. Um, oh really? Our, oh wow. Yeah. Our channels forever have been, exactly the same we share all our subscribers we talk like people will get in my comment section and say hey what's daniel think about this like we just we're always on the same oh, level that's, that's nice to have a friend it's who's wonderful. going through this growth process with you it's wonderful um but anyway uh what was oh yeah both of us we have the same mentality of the best way for us to maintain growth and maintain the love of our channels is um, to have a healthy balance of videos that we know perform well and we know will make the algorithm say, ooh, you regularly put out videos that perform well. I will continue to pay attention to you. And then do risky videos, things that are really outside of the box. Uh, talk, do Try creative concepts. He does a lot of skits. Um, I do a lot of like recommendations for really specific niche uh, genres or niche uh, topics, or I recently started reviewing Avatar, The Last Airbender, and that's been great for my channel. Um, just stepping outside of what's typical, and, uh, and then sometimes those videos will flop, and that's fine because we have these other videos that do well, and then sometimes one of those videos will spark, 
Uh, I have a Dear Author series that was just, hey, let's try something weird. Why not? And I, I did a Dear Authors video and it took off and now it's my most popular series that I do on my channel. Um, so taking those risks while also having a good balance of things that you know are safe has been really good for our growth. That's really great. You got your bread and butter, then you've got your edgier, just out, a little more outlying things. That, <laughs> just uh, different, something very unique to us that other it, people aren't doing. But like you say, it keeps your interest in the channel to yourself as well. So you can, right? and you, you know what, you start to know what does well. I've uh, heard from the YouTube uh, behind the scenes guys who run the algorithms that uh, some things really matter, like publishing consistently. If you are, sure. if you are publishing every Monday at, at seven o'clock, or every day at three o'clock, a consistent, a consistent message is better than a, even a, a once a year fantastic message. Uh, yeah. they, they give more points, more, more algorithm weight if you just keep putting things out there. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think you know, there's a lot to be said for that as far as just be, becoming better at your craft too and becoming better at your channel. Now, someone else, maybe, I don't know if you would agree with this, I was watching last week a someone talking about how to get your first thousand subscribers on YouTube. And he said, you know, just start before you're ready and, you know, do at least 35 episodes, you know, upload 35 videos. Uh, And he showed some of his early videos and he he was just, you know, he's past a million now, but he was just saying, you know, they, they weren't good. They weren't great, but they were the seeds of what it became. And he said, he got better at his craft by doing that. And then the algorithms start picking you up too, as you keep, putting things out. And so uh, you might be intimidated by doing 35 episodes of what would I talk about for 35 episodes. But if you're a writer and you have a message you want to get out there, then uh, you can, you can start to think of other things around that, that surround that, uh, you know, short stories or, you know, little, little nuggets here and there. Uh, Yeah, absolutely. If you have different, you know, diverse ideas that of things you want to talk about or do, should you have separate uh, channels or should everything just Mm -hmm. glom into one? What 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 topics are you are you thinking? Oh, of? for one thing, I do is sort of a uh, I do like a go through the Bible each year. I've been doing this for about six years, and so I'll I'll have sort of a I'll call it a little bit of a lightweight commentary on something about the reading that day. Uh, so so maybe you know that would be something maybe I would do is is actually do that reading or a little bit of talking uh, each day on. Uh, you know, whatever that Bible passage is and have people come along. But that would be quite different than um, like children's stories that I do. That would be like a whole different topic. So I w- I'm, I'll be watching your your channel for sure to, to really learn how it, how, it, how it should be done. But Thank you. Uh, um, I, I would say as long as it's not a stark difference, sounds like your interest completely relies within reading and discussing the text. So I think, for instance, I read a plethora of genres. I read primarily fantasy, but I love literary fiction, sci-fi, thrillers. I, I I have a lot of genres I read and it's all discussed in one place. And every now and then um, I talk about writing. Uh, I have a video coming out tomorrow talking about uh, being an avid reader as a severe dyslexic. And, um, you know, it's not always the same exact content. Uh, If you are going to talk about bike riding, motorcycles, fixing cars, make a second channel. The the first two are, the first two are topicals on my, on my heart, by the way. What, the... (laughs) The motorcycles and the bike riding. Motorcycles and motorcycles. Yeah, when you, yeah. When you, it's like when she she's been checking into my stuff here. Yeah. <laughs> well, then maybe make a second channel it, for those things. But, but it doesn't. Yeah, it doesn't exactly tie in with kids' stories and right, and, uh, exactly. and, and Bible studies. I think a common sentiment among YouTubers is a lot of times YouTubers will make a second channel because they're concerned that their audience won't be completely invested in everything they want to talk about. And then one of the two channels gets neglected, whether it's the first channel or the second channel, their interests end up shifting primarily here. And then that one turns into a wasteland and it's not good for the algorithm. And then there's a lot of, well, should I be doing it differently? So my advice is always, unless there are stark differences that you want to talk about two things that will not have any overlap in your audiences, just keep it in one place because 
people can choose not to click on that video and they'll click on the next one. It's really not that big of a deal. I um, was just looking today into becoming a, um, a narrator for Audible. It's interesting that that's what you did. And I wondered, how did you get started in that? I, uh, I have a video about how I got started. I'll link it in the chat. Um, okay. That might be helpful because I have a course I took. I have equipment. I have it all linked in the description. So it's probably the easiest answer. Um, but I, I narrated through ACX, which is owned by Audible. And it's their platform for connecting authors or publishers and narrators and helping them find each other so that they can produce their book. And I've looked into this before too. And you, you just sign up for acx.com and then you can make yourself known. You can put some samples up there of you reading some things. Uh, so there's the link and uh, I'll post this in the comments under the YouTube video too. So in a sense, you're, you're, you're doing a little bit of a reading or something. You're, you're sort of auditioning your voice. As a narrator, um, you just see what aud auditions are open you can choose your categories, what subject matter you want to cover, nonfiction, fiction, Christian fiction, um, or whatever you want to do. And, uh, and then you can read a little excerpt from the book. And if it looks like something you're interested in, then you can audition by reading that excerpt out loud and then submitting it. You do need certain equipment. You know, th there are technical sides to it. Um, and then the author will listen to auditions and pick their narrator. And, and so you see an ongoing something. updated list of uh, people that are looking for, and then you just mm -hmm. click on the one that you think you're interested in, read a sample yeah. for them, and then they contact you and you work out the deal. Yeah, it, it's, it's very saturated. Yeah. There's a lot of work out there to, to do. So it's, it's so they're fun. in need of narrators. It's saturated looking for narrators. Yeah. Both directions. There's plenty of narrators. There's plenty, plenty oh. of authors. But regardless, you have a lot of books to okay. choose from to okay. audition for. I just can't wait to read your next book when you do decide to do one, just because of all the incredible knowledge you've picked up from all your reading and your writing and your feedback and everything. I just think, I don't know if the pressure is going to be so high on you or if it's just <laughs> going to be such a joy because you'll finally be able to put all these little tidbits and secrets. And, you know, I, th I think you'll be able to put together a book that is just going to blow people away. So, Thank you. I really appreciate that. Yeah. I just loved reading your book and it was just fun. It was, it was a great a great read and very thoughtful, thought-provoking. So, Thank you. I appreciate yeah. that. Yeah. I do look forward to your next work. So when, when you, maybe I should sign up for your Patreon. I could read a no. short story every month. I'll give you a link. You do not have to pay. Or I'll uh -huh. just uh -huh. send you. I actually just finished a short story that's kind of Prodigal Son-esque that I'm really excited to share next month. Oh, cool. Do you ever get frustrated that it's only on Patreon and you want to share it with the world? Or are you really happy because you get paid for it? <laughs> I'm happy because of the medium that I've chosen now, because it means that it's a lot, lo a lot more. The way, the way I describe it is being online and having a decent sized platform. My humanity is judged frequently. Um, my taste in books, my personality, my tone of voice, how often I move my hands when I talk. Uh, and I, like the idea of my writing for now when it doesn't feel polished mm -hmm. enough yet being reserved for people that really really care about me and uh, you know do you know what i mean yeah it, definitely. Feels, it feels good to have it in this environment instead of having it for all of the world for now i hope that it eventually my writing skill gets to the point that i will feel ready to share it with the whole world though uh. That's a really sweet way to uh, experience it. I'm glad that you have that, that intimate audience there. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you so much, everyone who's come. Why don't we say a prayer? Thank you, Lord, for this group. And thank you for our incredible speakers and what they shared and just their knowledge that they've uh, received from you and from their life experience. And I pray, God, that you would help us to put that into practice for our own work, for our own books. Help us, God, reach, uh, reach the people you want us to reach. God, we just trust that you would put us in touch with the people who need to, need to hear our message, our particular message. And Lord, put us in touch with people we need to hear too. And help us all just to keep strong in our faith uh, until you come again. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>